Good morning and welcome to the Tech Central podcast. I'm doing an out-of-town recording again. I'm so spoilt. I'm in Fishhook. And today, my coffee is sponsored by Instant, the worst kind of coffee to drink in the morning, honestly. But I did have a run along the beachfront, and I can say that this is easily the most beautiful city in the world in my mind. Today, we are joined by Sage and Varish Harduth, who is the VP of the small business segment, is giving us some time on the podcast. And I'm very excited about this. Because as we know, our economy is underpinned by small business. Varesh, you have been very vocal in this area. You've held this position for a while. Today, we are going to get under the skin of this leader of this vibrant area. But before we dive into that and a couple of ideas that you've got, how long have you been with Sage and in the small business segment? Hi, morning, Daniel. Thank you for having me on. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I've been with Sage now just going on seven years, not in this role. So a bit of my background is I started off in the pension sector, mainly because of what I studied. And then I evolved into banking, where I think I really cut my teeth and was exposed to a lot. I entered Sage when I was a pricing strategist. So very strategic role a lot of financial modeling, and at Sage, the exposure to the way the business is run, and in particular, the small business segment, really fascinated me. So I spent my first few years at Sage working with the collective business, but a lot of time in small business. And when the opportunity came to head up the small segment, I jumped at it. So I've been in the small segment role for the last four years. Awesome. And why do you like this market segment? What makes it different? So I know it's something that probably comes across a bit cliched, but as much as most businesses want to be agile and have things change quickly, I don't think in our space there's anything as agile as small business. It's Mm. one, you get exposed to such a wide variety of individuals that represent small business. I know some of the terms have to group. And within small business, we're talking everything from a person who's got an idea thinking, should they take that step, that risk-seeking step of going it themselves, to someone who generally has a good amount of employees that they've had for years and they contribute something meaningful to society. So that spectrum of individuals, everyone has a story. When you engage with small business owners, their passion rubs off on you. You can't Mm. help but Mm. have it rub off on you. And so the people we deal with definitely fuels that passion. And then also Mm. the dynamic within the segment team. It's a fast moving team, try to do the right thing. There's never two similar days, but the pace keeps me interested. So a lot of factors make it an exciting space. Awesome. It keeps you young. I tell you that for sure. What is the key passion or positioning where you see success in this segment? I think it's going to be one of those kind of answers where it has to start with passion, especially if, if you want to be successful the amount of effort it takes. If you're a small business owner, the hours small business owners work, they basically, every role a corporate has in one person, whether they know it or not. So you have to have the passion. I think that extends to all of us. I mean, hopefully it does. Whether you work in a corporate role, whether you're doing a podcast, you have to have that passion. It comes Mm -hmm. across. People feel it. People want to be part of it by what you're selling, Mm -hmm. follow you if you're a leader, Mm -hmm. or just be around you. So that passion has to be where it starts. That passion will definitely attract the initial kickoff phase. But then post that, the substance has to be there. The way you do it, the checks and balances, the transparency. So I would always say it starts with passion, but other components have to be there very quickly once that passion creates the excitement. You know, and you've written enough about this and published enough articles. You talk around the predictability of the business through systems and processes that are in place and a discipline, almost a Zen discipline towards getting the business right. You see that fueling growth and replicability making it that they can grow. I was wondering if you, where do you see the most growth at the moment in your segment? Is there an industry set or is it just individuals that are making a difference? So it's interesting. It's actually quite a detailed question because we live by the analytics of our customers. We're always trying to understand the trend and we're looking at where the new customer acquisition, the new first-time buyers are coming from in terms of segment or sector. 
And then we also spend a lot of time understanding our install based customers, uh, some of which have been with us for over 15 years. And there's two different things we see is that in difficult times, which granted everyone's going through, it's, yeah. it's been a tough economy even before COVID. Small businesses are definitely more robust. We've seen it for the last few years, a trend where a lot of I'm saying small business, but entrepreneurs are taking that step to formalize, whether it be the software or the processes, to give them the best chance of making it. So yeah. even whenever we see a bit of a downturn or tough economic times, we do tend to be more robust or even say an uptick in people looking to buy software. And that's from all sectors, but we do see a massive increase in entrepreneurs entering the space. And in the install base side, we see a lot of established businesses transitioning from a desktop product to a cloud product for various reasons as well. But I wouldn't call out an individual sector. I would say we definitely see a lot of first-time buyers making the move from Excel or manual as being our NCA and a lot of migrations from our desktop to our cloud product. Wow, that's so counterintuitive. But I guess if you chew on it, it makes sense. People want to get better at what they're doing and spend less for what their returns are on the internal side. They can't afford any wastage anymore. And that could probably give you meteoric growth just by changing a few things, plugging a few holes. And you've written a little bit about that. How does Sage help these business people, these entrepreneurs who are taking that next step to A, start the business or B, batten down the hatches and grow it through these stormy times? So I think the biggest thing or the biggest contributor that Sage does is um, over and above, I think there's a lot of stuff we put out as thought leaders, making sure if you were looking to become a small business that you're aware of what you need to do to formalize it. I think that there's out a lot on the internet. Where Sage really assists is the approach we've taken to our offering and our software offering has changed so dramatically over the last 10 years. So when I joined the business and even prior to that, we were still a market leader in terms of it. It's what's taught in universities, but it was very much a accounting compliance tool. Mm. And there used to be a life cycle where when your business reached a certain point, and that, that was personal to the business, mm. where you moved away from Excel and manual wasn't doing it enough. So it was mm. almost like a scaling. You got to the point where maybe there's too many transactions now. Yes. So now it was time to get someone or the one person in your business who was a bookkeeper did your financials and that person learned the product or to a large extent, a lot of people have an accountant helping mm-hmm. them with mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. What we've seen over the last seven years, and it's literally increased year on year mm-hmm. in terms of it, is the technology bump has allowed for a lot of the tools that were available for medium sized companies to actually shrink down or scale down to a small business. And with the adoption of mobile, the software has adapted as well. So you're now at a point where even before you looking to enter or formalize your business, there's software, apps, something on mobile that can assist you. And that's where I think Sage really has helped is we've moved with the change in demand and the increases in technology to give the same solution much earlier in your cycle or at any point in your Mm. cycle. Mm. So if, for example, if you haven't formalized, you're not VAT registered, you don't have a product Mm. that's VAT an issue. If you serve, sell a product or a service, chances are you need to get an invoice or a quote in Mm. front of someone. And that happens every day in South Africa. A lot of people, informal, micro, you sell a product. Once you start formalizing, that invoice now is representing you as a business. And also the way you can collect it. So the one thing I love, and it's, it's the solution's not unique to Sage, but this is the kind of tech that really makes me excited because the price point has stripped all the way down and you get freemium models and yeah. Yeah. pays you use or whatever it is. So it's making the barriers of entry less and less. But effectively, Daniel, if you had, I'll give you a perfect example. Let's say you were a garden service, right? Now maybe you're a small business owner who has a garden service and word of mouth spreads your business. So you have a group of 20, 30 houses that you perform garden service activity on. Most times that entrepreneur is just keeping a manual record. Maybe you Mm. get a formalized Mm. written invoice. Otherwise, it's just a bit ad hoc. I'll pick it up. You could create an invoice on your mobile phone, right? Pre-generated with the template. You just put the number in that you could then email to the person you're performing the task for. Within Sage, that invoicing only product is our entry product but it allows you six different 
collection or payment methods that you'd have to do nothing about. So automatically as a small business, you can give your customer the option of QR code payments, credit card, instant EFT, even payments, the scan codes that you can pay at pick and pay and checkers. All of that, all the text provided for you. Literally, if you want to tweak your logo, you can. The rest of it's pretty much done. And that, that there is now keeping a running tally of collections, who's owing you, you can yeah. then get all of that as an entry product. Now, I mean, if you have to pitch this, if you have to actually explain to someone and you tell them what the product is, they'll start back and go, oh, no, I'm not big enough for that. I don't yeah. have the money. Yeah. And then as you see it, so, I mean, the technology has made something that's so seamless and it's a really cool feature for everyone involved down to the entry level product. I can't, believe you, I can't believe you weren't there when my daughter launched her book. I'm just thinking about how much easier that would have been for her book sales. Do you know what I mean? That is such a nifty little solution. And what I made a note of, the barriers to entry are so low for digital adoption that there's actually no excuse around this. You know, there's no excuse for the informality anymore. We should be getting it better and raising and differentiating. And that's what software does, doesn't it? I'm a big fan, I must say. So let's take a little journey out and go into Varesh as a leader. What are the biggest challenges with your role and how do you overcome them? Because Sage is a tough place to work. I mean, you're numbers driven. You got to get in there. This is not a family business. How do you survive there, Varesh? How do you make it happen? On a personal, I think it's a very personal question. So I'll answer it very much from my point of view. Yeah. My previous roles, I mean, like most people, I think when you end in a position, you kind of look back and go, how did you find yourself there? Because we all had a passion. So I studied something that was very theoretical. I've got a background, uh, my degree is in actuarial science. So you straight away went into pensions and you did financial money. So it wasn't, it was a role I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed the subject. When I worked at Sage, and I've always had a passion of working with people in teams, you know, trying to tackle big problems. So most of my career was working in roles where you were running projects. And I've always wanted to know if I could head up a team, but normally I was a person doing the financial modeling and then presenting the strategy on a lovely PowerPoint and convincing people to go in a direction. And at Sage, the opportunity arose where I could actually then run the team and implement it as well, as opposed to just trying to get buy-in mm -hmm. from senior people. Mm -hmm. For me personally, I think I've approached it because of my background. I think everyone does it that way. You lean on your strengths mm -hmm. and the, Metrics and numbers are my natural strength. So when I came into a team, it was a team of people who have been there for a long time. Mm. And then we brought in an approach of just trying to put the metrics that everyone would understand. They would understand why it was important. And I spent the first year trying to embed how everyone's role rolled into this number that we were trying to achieve. So mm. it was real buy-in. It was trying to, trying to get closer that whoever you were in the division – that contribution via a dashboard roll into a number. So immediately we changed the culture where people started seeing that every activity linked back mm. to the collective success. And mm. I was very fortunate. I mean, I've got a great team and you have to have a few people who believe in where you want to take it. And mm. I was very fortunate that my leadership team resonated with the vision and they drove it very hard as well. And then, you know, results breeds credibility and more mm. trust. And before you know mm. it, you're snowballing it. But in terms of the day-to-day, and that's where we all kind of miss being in the office. We are very, I know everyone says they're a flat structure, but you learn more from speaking to people on the floor mm. than any presentation or Teams meeting. The water cooler. And we drive it that way. But we also, in terms of, because we have so many people that deal with customer all the time, I mean, we, mm. we are a software company, mm. first and foremost. And as much as we're adopting all the tech to make interaction with us seamless, at the end of the day, we still speak to our customer as much as we can. And so the feedback from whether it be the sales team, bringing back questions customers have, like transitioning to the cloud. For us, it's our obsession. So we know the detail, but taking people on the journey with us. So we try and get mm. that feedback constantly on the customer support side, the complaints mm. division. You probably learn more in customer service and support about your product and your business than anywhere else. Mm. So all of that, we try and build in that everyone has a voice. There's definitely that move quick, the number is important, mm. but that foundation of do the right thing. And it's hard. There's so many things written on it. I try and expose myself to as much as I can. But what I found works best is provide a clear vision and everyone understands how we're going to get there. And then yeah. you have to give people the opportunity to question. Okay. So we have a very questioning culture and that guides yeah. us on a day-to-day. 
Yeah, you seem quite scary. I don't know if I'd question you. And <laughs> what's the biggest surprise you've had in the past six months and why? I'd extend a bit further than the six months. And I'll tell you a funny story. I mean, well, corporate funny anyway. <laughs> so um, in end of March 2020, just before COVID really hit and the first case in South Africa, I think, just landed, we were doing a study in the team because there's a big move, obviously, to create a flexible environment for workers and some flexibility on maternity leave, paternity leave. And the question started arising is, could we have more people work flexi time? And I mean, anyone in South Africa, it's evolved a lot, mm. but we still have this, you know, everyone likes to go to the office. People have school runs and you end up in the office and there's a manager and things like that. Mm. So the question was, could we transition to having more people work from home or not? And we were actually doing surveys and crunching the numbers. And in the midst of that, when we were compiling this report, COVID hit and everyone worked from home the next day. We had some hiccups with the data. And stuff. <laughs> no survey. The next day, no survey, <laughs> yeah. uh, call center, everyone worked via Teams. We found our feet very quickly and we were very fortunate. The business really supported everyone. Yeah. And we literally went, well, that's the quickest learning right there. And, <laughs> uh, not that we ever questioned it, but I think the mentality of, I think any good work environment, you have a trust element, but to see how everyone without the traditional formalized methods carried the weight, pushed hard, the passion was still there, they still chased yeah. things. And I think for me, that was the most fascinating thing. And I think the learning lesson, and we talk about it every now and then is, if anything, what we've learned from this COVID period is whenever, whatever that new version looks like, mm. everyone's on that right to have the flexibility and it's kind of changed the view of what you are as a business. You know, it's not just people logging in or coming in the morning, having a coffee and working for the paycheck. There's definitely a genuine change in people have a purpose for something. So on a personal level and working with a massive team, yeah. it's something like I'll definitely keep, even when things do hopefully come back to a, a proper normal, mm. like we won't forget those mm. lessons. Everyone has earned the right for flexibility. People have a purpose. I like that. I'm keeping that. My third question, and then I'm going to get back into some more practical tips you've got. How do you continue to learn and stay on top of your role, Varesh? Daniel, honestly, and it's going to sound a bit, maybe a bit fluffy, but you just have to be one, I think, continuously expose yourself to okay. what's out there. I think we all do things that we know we do well. And we have metrics that tell us we're doing things well. But if you fall into that lull where you define by a number or a one metric or whatever it is, you are closing down. So I do try and expose myself, whether it be reading or listening to things just in terms of different thinking. Not everything, yeah. I don't eat it all up. Some of the things I'm very yeah. skeptical about, but at least expose myself to some of the thinking and really talking to more and more people within okay. my sphere. So within the team dynamic, whether it be in the leadership team, a new entrant, I love speaking to new joiners in the business for the first couple of months and see how they evolve. Those fresh eyes will always give you a good perspective. Awesome. awesome. So those kind of things. But as well as if you keep exposing yourself, something stick, even if it doesn't stick, it shapes out what your traditional thought was. So yeah. I try and do that as much as possible. So now you've got this big team, you've made reference to them, they've scattered around South Africa, they are helping business people embrace this digital change, this transition from accounting into business enablement software. That was my, how I interpreted what you guys do. What is your team's role in your client's business journey? And I'm thinking specifically of these people who are tragically affected by both KZN and Joburg rights. What is Sage doing about that? So I'll give it a bit of context so the answer makes a bit more sense. So the way we sell, Daniel, it's not just via Sage, via yeah. direct selling. We do, obviously, that's a big portion of our business, but mm -hmm. we have actually quite a substantial ecosystem. So we have business partners or resellers. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them traditionally, and this is like from more than 20 years, they help mm -hmm. build the business. They obviously also hardware providers. So resellers, you get the ones that only do software and they offer services around that software and you get ones who resell a few things. And then we have a very substantial accountants base that also is part of the ecosystem. So mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. if you were looking to buy software and you wanted to buy it direct, you would Google search it and you'd deal with us. If you had a business partner who approached you, they would help you set up. Or if you were a small business who went, you know what, I'm going to do everything via an accountant. Mm. The accountants who use our software are part mm. of the ecosystem. And that's how broad the spectrum is. So in terms of 
COVID, I think we had some really, I know it's been a while now, 18 months, where we listened to our customer. We obviously tried to assist them as much as we could in terms of providing the COVID hub, guiding them where we could in terms of what government was offering, what certain mm. sectors were offering, talking them through. Because we do accounting and payroll, a lot of the incentives that government put in place were payroll-centric. So mm. the software, obviously, we keep it compliant. We were able to talk them through those changes and what it meant. And because we have this footprint, we're able to also expose customers to a larger ecosystem to help them. So we have third-party providers that have solutions that were quite useful to people during COVID. During mm. the riots, I mean, it was, I think all of us took a real step back, but the impact being predominantly KZN and portions of Gauteng, mm. we were able to identify all KZN customers and we reached out through that extended network. So it wasn't just us calling customers. It was a bad time to just call and find out. Yeah. We had obviously accountants, business partners reaching out. And up till now, we're assessing and credit to those businesses. The ones who we spoke to, and we've got a lot of data around it, but effectively, the ones that were unimpacted, put their hands straight up and go, I had no impact. Right. Let me know if I can help. Then you had customers who were impacted. And obviously, and this is this is part of it, maybe all the way back to your first point is, you know, being compliant and being able to communicate your business. Mm. It's critical for lots of things, not just for yourself to make sure, mm. you know, you financially sound. Whether you want to have investors come in, you need to communicate it. But when mm. it comes time to a crisis where you need to, for insurance purposes, for mm. like mm. we saw in COVID, be able to access some funds, you need to be able to have a view mm. of where your exposure was. Mm. So the businesses, and I think this is where the desktop product, predominantly the cloud product, the data was always going to be safe. Desktop, if you were using it on your physical PC, we did have a few sad cases where people didn't do backups, you know, mm. human behavior. Mm. Obviously, on the cloud product, you didn't have to worry about that. So mm. we tried to help out as a community to help people. And then you had the business owners who said, look, I've lost everything. Mm. And sure. credit to them from that there, a lot of them said, let's keep talking. I'm hoping to get back up four months, six months, whatever yeah. it is. So in terms of where Sage has tried to assist, we've obviously tried to take off any financial commitment burdens with Sage, you know, yeah. offer them what we could. And yeah. I think the bigger assistance has been, again, exposing them to the larger community we have okay. to assist where we can. Okay. Yeah. So if I can summarize that, you phoned the base, phoned the accountants who were looking after some of these people, found out where their business was affected, I've heard cases where you're talking about reports which should be run just to give you an inventory so you can see what stock was missing. And then for insurance purposes, we can do a way up for the other customers. If they were on-prem product and they've lost all their product, maybe a migration path to cloud so they could get their business up and running. And then just helping them and being an open partner to them to help and advise on how they could get up and running quickly. Really hats off to you. I think your area was affected quite significantly. There were a number of big logos that were affected and we saw the factories yeah. burning down, but it's the periphery of those people who are just trying to get out of small business into business that really we felt for. Okay, that's pretty cool. That's what you said you were going to do. That's what you did. So what do we do now in our small to small business sector that differentiates us. What is your three pieces of advice? I know you've written about this. I want to hear you say it again. What do you suggest for small businesses going forward now in this digital age? What should they be focused on when thinking about their operational efficiencies? So I'm very consistent on this message because I truly believe it. it. And it is small businesses, you stay committed to your passion, right? Whatever got you to start the small business, that's what you're really passionate about, right? And that's where you want to spend most of your time. You want to get that passion across to as many people as you can, whether it be a service, a product, whatever it is. That there has to be your number one. What you can't lose sight of is that passion has to be reinforced. So technology, and I saw that someone actually sent this to me recently. They took a snapshot, someone sent it to me, and they went, technology is the hack for small business, meaning that if you use technology, you can hack it in terms of making it easier to a big business by using tech. So I would say if, wherever you are in your business cycle, even if you've been established for a number of years, and I think if you look at a lot of good business owners, they know their business inside out. 
whatever they're using. You have to be able to extend that. Make it easier on yourself. So you want to spend all the time around your passion and what's important to grow in your business. You don't need to spend time on admin. You don't need to spend time on reconning. You don't have to spend the weekends. Where you, and I mean, it's a tough life. Being an entrepreneur and a small business owner is a very tough life. So holidays, time with your family, all of that has to be slotted in with keeping stuff going. You can get all that time, focus on your business, whatever else balances you out, and all the automation of things that you're convinced you can't automate. Trust me, you can. Mm. There's software, mm. there's applications. Mm. Expose yourself to that. So adopt as much technology that makes your life simple. And good technology doesn't require manuals. It's very seamless. How all of us have easily adopted to our mobile phones. Like the one thing I love about new tech is it doesn't come with a manual anymore. And I'm old enough where I used to read the manuals before I started anything. So the first time I got a smartphone and there was no instructions, it threw me off slightly. Yes, we all yes. show in our age, I suppose. But good tech is that it's seamless. It's intuitive. Yeah. So expose yourself to that. The third part is make sure that at any point, now if I had to stop any business owner and say, give me a pitch on what your business does, they will talk for hours and you could see that passion on I provide this, the product I sell, the service I sell. Have that same passion and ability. If I had to stop and say, how's your business doing? You should be able to be able to answer that. Revenue, cash flow, expenses, Mm. that ability Mm. to speak should be as seamless as the passion you have for your actual product or service. And everything I'm saying now, literally, because of the automation and the reports that follow, you can get daily dashes sent to your device you can even set limits on Mm. my cash flow position and get an alert on your smartwatch or your Mm. phone Mm. or on a daily email or whoever needs to be that Mm. level of detail is available without you having to crunch anything so if you're a business owner be able to speak that same detail about your business or your financial soundness and if you can do that you're automatically having a different view you can start having conversations whether it's to expand Mm. to get additional investors Mm. There's something, and I'm going to deviate slightly. I think all of us have that program that we used to watch, and reality TV has made it that. But if you look at the Shark Tank, Dragon's Day, and all those kind, we, I love watching those kind of shows. More to see how people pitch their business. But if you strip it down, the theater side of the show, listen to the questions they always ask that small business owner. They definitely want to pitch the idea of what do you do? What does your product do? Is there some novelty to it? Is there some substance to it? But at the base of it, it always comes down to the same questions, which is, what's the financial soundness of your business? Will I invest? Will I? And that, that investment's not just, if you look at investors, it's a clear indicator whether your business is doing well or not. Mm. So you should have that same passion to it. So really focus on your financial soundness. Once you have a view of your financial soundness, you can take it wherever you want. Absolutely. Then you can look to optimize on expenses. Mm. You can look to optimize on growth you will then very quickly see in the trends that come out, do you have seasonality of purchase? Have you reached a cap of expansion given how you're marketing your product? And then even in the marketing space, you look at social media, and I know social media is still that animal we all truly to fully understand. Mm -hmm. But depending on where you're based, creating good content. I mean, there used to be a time four years ago when we were trying to convince people that you need to get your business online. I mean, it's evolved so much. It's very rare to find someone that you can't find. It's also being online is forming part of the trust element that you're a credible business. Mm. If you mention something to me, the first thing I'm going to do is search it. Mm. And if I don't find you online, I'm going to start questioning, "Mm, is it, isn't it? But leveraging and speaking to your customer has always been important. Now it's important across all media channels. Mm. You may take the time to create that WhatsApp group, that Facebook site whatever's new, but you control your brand fully on all these things, how mm. you interact with the customer. Mm. I think before, and I don't want to say it in a bad way, but Hello Peter used to be a thing when I was just starting off working. If you were on Hello Peter, it was a massive thing. That level of customer engagement is everything that's out there on you. Mm. Take mm. it seriously. Make sure you engage. Ask your customer. Mm. There's no excuse for not being able to ask your customer Are you happy? What would you like to see? It then brings in the ability of flexibility, payment plans, how you structure your deals. And all of that, you could do it where I think I'm going to do something. 
but you could also do it where all the information's at your fingertips and you can make an informed decision. So Excellent. I don't know if it was three exactly, Daniel, but no, that would be my take. Perfect. It's perfect. As we come to the end of our time, Varish, I want to ask, what are you most excited for coming out of Sage in the next six months? What is being released that you're excited about for your sector? So there's a couple of things, but I will tie it back to what I've been saying. So our philosophy now and the way we're dealing is to make things as seamless, as integrated, add more value to the customer without it being in front of them. So we've released recently, and we're very proud of it, is we have a direct bank feeds with F&B. Okay. And just for you know, people who might not know what that basically means is you've always been able to get your transactional data from your banking system into software. It started off with manual, and yeah. that is a way to get it. Yeah. Then it was uploading of CSV files. Then it moved to a technology called screen scraping. Basically, it was sort of automated, but lots of issues. If any, it was very finicky if anything changed on either side. And now we're at a point where direct bank feeds is 100% recon, automatically real-time, zero errors, wow. 100% thing. So basically, you then have your transactional data from your bank going into your software without any issue. And the amount of time that saves and the finger errors and the risk is something amazing. That comes at no additional cost between F&B and ourselves. There's no cost on either side for having this feature. It's just being banked with F&B and we're obviously looking to expand it to the other banks, wow. uh, into the software. That's really exciting. Really, wow. exciting. I know when we did wow. a bit of PR for it, the gentleman from F&B invited me to sit in a panel and the banking community it was in America they were obsessed. They kept on asking, but how are you monetizing this? Yeah, yeah. And we both were saying, no, there's no cost in it. And they're like, but we don't understand how do you monetize it? And then we're trying to expand. This is where South Africa is very far ahead in some instances. Yeah. I don't think we fully yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. And we're trying to say, you talk about customer-centric or software as a service. This is what it looks like. The service continues and you're paying for a service in a subscription model, but it's not like, if you want this, here's another yeah. fee. So yeah. that, host that to host really banking. Spot. That is exciting for the small business. Wow. Varesh, our time is coming to an end. I want to ask you your advice for non-SAGE customers out there in your segment. What advice would you give them over the next year with regards to working in these turbulent times? And I know you've spoken about automation and I know you've spoken about getting smarter and getting into the digital economy. Is there one pearl that you've got for them? Daniel, I'll say this twofold, right? First, if there's anyone who's not a Sage customer and not using anything tech-related, please expose yourself to something tech-related, right? Okay. Obviously, I'm always going to be banking the product. I believe in our product. But if you have nothing, there are so many providers out there. There's so many mobile apps. Even if you just educate yourself on what's available, shop around, competition's great. It keeps us being innovative. It makes us be better. So see what's out there that meets your need. Why I would say if you on a product and not a Sage product, we still have, even though we are a global company, our roots lie in SA. Our base is in Johannesburg. We've got satellite offices. Mm. We've got a massive start complement. We have localized support and development. Mm. And in 2015, 2016, when the VAT change came, I think that was us at our best, how quickly mm. we adapted and local businesses felt that. So uh, if you, in terms of a South African business owner, knowing that we are accountable, mm. we try our best, we don't do everything right all the time, mm. but we have a local footprint, which means a lot. Anyway, I think in tech, you can take it for granted that the tech's everywhere, but it does make a difference that we're locally based. And then in terms of where we're taking it, the vision and values is around making the best customer experience, exposing mm. and building our ecosystem further mm. and further. So we're trying to partner with so many third-party South African ISVs or app designers to bring more and more feature sets. So we've got a marketplace that's growing continuously. Once you have our core product, it will then open your business up to whatever solution need you have, you'll find it. Even if we don't develop it ourselves, they're part of our ecosystem. So I know I've given a bit of an all over answer, but awesome. my main message is wherever you are, if you're thinking of taking that really scary risk-seeking step of delving into small business, give yourself the best mm -hmm. chance. Mm -hmm. And if you are a small business whose success, we all, we all have a vested interest in small business mm -hmm. success. Mm -hmm. Also expose yourself, give yourself the best chance. And I always end everything, Daniel, is if you are 
neither a small business owner, and this all makes sense, and you read the stuff, support a small business. Oh, right? Varish, we all can support a come small on. I love that, Varish. I love that. It's almost that buy local, buy in your area. I'm in Cape Town, as you know, and there's a real groundswell of supporting the small businesses around here. And I can only say I echo your sentiment. Varish, it's been an absolute pleasure to sit with you and get an understanding for how you're managing the small business area. I think you're a quiet leader in this space. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you're open to meeting with customers. So folks, if you want some good advice, go and speak to Varesh Hadouth or his team who are scattered throughout South Africa. If you're an accountant or a business partner, uh, you know what Sage does for you. Good luck with that. From my side in a somewhat sunny fishhook, I'd like to say thank you for giving me 45 minutes of your day. I hope you go on to great things today. And soon we'll both be drinking better coffee because instant really is, is not for me. From myself at the Tech Central team, Daniel Robus, I hope you have an amazing day and go out and support local businesses. 